Test, test. Test. Ooh, hey, my you... voice. Hello, God. Please take me home. Um, we're just going to make a semicircle just so that, you know, we're here, you're there. I hate being actually not be able to see, have someone behind me. I don't know about you guys. I don't like people behind me, so. We're also trying to keep this as open as possible because this is more of a conversation than anything yeah. else. Because, like, nobody has all the answers on how to really make a gender-inclusive campus or gender-inclusive organization. And so we want it to be a conversation because, it, as it suggests in the name, inclusivity means all of us, so. And every chapter is different, right? You guys might have some great tips that I didn't even think about in Alaska or in, at Clemson. So, but before that, we're going to first acknowledge. So the big thing in Alaska is our indigenous people. We are very respectful of the land. So before we do anything, we're going to do a land acknowledgement. So every big meeting, you always acknowledge the native or indigenous people that came before us. It's an Alaska thing. I love it because it's just different. So this land that we're on, we would thank the Seminoles for creating this great land and giving us a great place to meet, um, bringing us all from across the world together and having a great conference. Short and simple. So my name is Becky. Um, I'm a transgender veteran. It's a weird thing to say. We're there. We've been here since, what, Civil War is the first actually transgender veteran known. But they go back even further into the, come into the circle. You're not going to, I will pull you in here. <laughs> if you're in the back, I will make you speak for 20 minutes. See, I got you. Um, they Perfect. go back to like the knights, night era, medieval time, where kings and knights would, women would dress up as men to be a knight or vice versa. Transgenders have been all over the military spectrum. Um, and we're becoming more open, you know? My other role, I just became president this today. Thank you for uh, University of Alaska Anchorage. <laughs> Second time. I was originally here in 2020 at the LA conference. I was president then too. Graduated, went back to finish some prereqs for med school and my president just resigned. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll step up and take it back. Why did I do that? <laughs> um, I'm also on a board called Trans American Veterans Association. I'm the strategic collaborative partnership and something else title. Really long title. I just say I'm there to help out and bring the old people into the new times because it's very stacked with old people. And I'm like, no, we can't just worry about the VA. You got to worry about everything else. So when I, and this is Tia. Hi, so my name is Tia. I currently am the SVA president over at Clemson University. I also work for Clemson University's Military and Veteran Engagement Office. Um, I met Becky because I originally uh, grew up in Alaska, so that was a pretty cool connection to make. I actually met her on Thursday, and I kind of got shoehorned into presenting here today. Um, I myself am not transgender, however, I have a lot of friends and I know a lot of people who are. And it is worth noting that I am not the first woman to be elected to be the SVA president. I'm actually the third woman. And uh, one of the main reasons that I'm here today is that of my SVA executive team, which is a team of five, three of them are women. So we're really working at Clemson to kind of break down the barriers of gender and help the both the university and the SVA itself become more inclusive and allow those different voices to be heard. So what does inclusive mean to you guys? Go for it. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian Ulbrich. I'm just a general SVA member at the University of Georgia chapter. Uh, to start off, inclus what inclusive of not is just a buzzword that people say to kind of feel good or basically to virtue signal. I think before we establish that, just kind of kibosh what is not so we can actually get to what we really need to do. But I think it's, inclusivity to me is just breaking down to the most basic human interaction of just being social and 
bringing people in and not outcasting others. Yeah, um, that's a big point. You could be inclusive doesn't mean just minorities, women, males, LGBT. It could be a cis white guy that likes to do art, do um, craft stuff and the club being more physical, like doing push-ups, bowling, to bring those in. I know at UAA, before I was president, we were very that strict male policy. We went to the VFW, we did push-up bar, we did whatever, all the, I don't know what we did. All the traditionally masculine yeah. military things. We, went, we did hockey games, they played hockey, they went all the sports stuff. When I came in, I flipped it. We, I made connections with all the other clubs. I went to, it's called drag, it's our LGBT group. Drag shows, I participated in them. I did for like carnival stuff. We did, we added in like count the marbles in this jar, play with Play-Doh, create pancakes. Um, we try to do, bring the feminization into the, not even feminization, but different options into the club. We didn't want to be one club all. Our, so big thing in Anchorage is our golf. It's a big charity event. You make mini golf sections. And we did a half like makeup and half army boot camp style thing. And my, pre my first presidency, it was three women, me, one trans, me, and then we had our, my vice president was an African American male. We had no cis white guys at all running with us. So it was a different take from the previous where everyone else has been vice president, treasurer, everything has been cis male, cis white male. So they were always thinking, oh, let's go to the VFW and drink. We all voted no drinking that year because we're like, we wanted to bring away from alcoholism, which Alaska deals with a lot. But it's important to notice when we're talking about things like in inclusivity when it comes to gender and just kind of inclusivity in general is it goes kind of hand in hand with intersectionality. Which again, like you were talking of how it can be kind of a buzzword of a lot of people are saying like intersectional and inclusive and they can be, they can sound kind of like buzzwords in a lot of ways. But when it comes down to it, things like inclusivity and um, intersectionality, they apply to everybody. It's inter intersectionality specifically is like breaking down this concept of that oh, you're only one part of your identity, it's where do your identities intersect, how, who are you as a person, and who do you want to be as a person? And that kind of goes hand in hand with inclusivity, because inclusivity isn't just looking at male versus female, trans versus cis kind of deal. It's looking at the, what do we want to do as a chapter? Who do we want to invite in? Are we looking for a specific group, or are we just trying to look for that, those diverse voices? because a lot of the times you run into issues where if everyone in your executive team or everybody in your club is the same, is very similar, yes, they're gonna have differing experiences and that's very valuable, but they're not gonna have the same experience. Uh, a straight person isn't gonna have the same experience as a gay person in the military. A white person isn't gonna have the same experience as a person of color in the military. Uh, a woman isn't gonna have the same experience as a man in the military. So bringing in those diverse opinions is really important and can strengthen the club because it's not just all one voice. And that kind of goes for, if, it, if your club's all women, you also run into that same issue. And I know a lot of the times inclusivity and things like that can be used, like you said, as buzzwords and virtue signaling, but that's kind of, that's not really the point here. It's to get those diverse voices and to get that big group of people so we can actually truly represent what it means to be a veteran, especially at SVA. So I'm gonna do this real fast. Whose club has more than 10 people? Whose club has more than 20? Okay, we're gonna do the opposite now. Whose club has three members? <laughs> well, well we're glad to have you nonetheless. Whose club has about six or above? Okay, it's perfect. So the thing is, if you build a club, you gotta think about what are your connections, right? Where can you branch off? One of the reasons why I, my group, we partnered with so many different other clubs, the Latino club, the LGBT clubs, the African American Honor Society, the fraternities, the sororities, the, which Alaska has two. 
which is big. When I when Just I went to when I was looking zero. at colleges and uh, I think I was looking at colleges in 2011. There were zero sororities and fraternities, yeah. so it's pretty big that Alaska has this now. So I mean, we did Miss, a a, side note. Miss America. If you didn't know, is from Alaska. She actually was from UA. Got a little but, piece, but uh, we look we looked at to build how to build a club more. When we started, we in 2019 beginning of school year we had six members. By the last meeting before COVID took us down, we had 20. And it was by making these connections with these other clubs to find the veterans that don't want to be that veteran standard. Who, did anyone go to the LGBT research one breakout? They said that people pick their identities. They might, be, they might lean more towards the LGBT instead of doing the veterans. So we wanted to make sure that they knew that they were welcome to do both. We weren't going to be a place that they weren't going to be safe. At the end of the day, SVA is designed to be a place for all veterans. Uh, regardless of what they've gone through, regardless of where they, cam they come from, you as a veteran have earned the right to be in this space and to interact with your, co with your um, I was going to say cohort, but that's not really the right word, but to interact with people who have gone through a similar aspect of you. And we are all, all if I can speak English, that would be nice. We are all related by the fact that we are veterans. That is a single unifying truth, and it's what can we find within those identities and within that kind of the sphere of gender inclusivity? What can we find to make it more welcoming? What can we find to make it more accessible? What can we do to help kind of stop the statistics of when women get out of the military, they tend to disconnect with their veteran identity. They tend to disconnect with veteran status in a lot of ways. And the same goes for LGBTQ plus individuals, trans individuals. Even those veterans are more artsy. A lot of the times veterans have this idea of a veteran. Uh, people have this idea of what a veteran should be. So it's very important looking at this inclusivity piece to pull that into the, the chapters count. and show that, hey, we want all veterans to come here. And I'm sure that's the goal of all of y'all's chapters is to grow the chapters and to have more people come to meetings and get more diverse voices or just get more voices in a lot of cases. And don't get me wrong, I still, we still do, we have a big barbecue and we still play football or actually play hockey because that's an Alaska thing to do, I guess. I'm originally from Southern California, so I'm like, oh, this is cool. I'm a baseball kid, softball. <laughs> but we, we just added other things. If we're going to do a big barbecue and have the spring hockey game, we add, we add another thing, like have an arts project, like, be like, hey, anyone that wants to turn in an art piece, and have that judged by the members. Or, hey, are you really good at cooking? Would you like to help with the barbecue, actually cooking and make meals for us? You know, We try to make sure that the, we don't just make one event. You make it so that you, everyone would want to come. So that brings us kind of to the how do, we, um, how do we approach this idea of bringing in more people, of making a inclusive, uh, a gender inclusive chapter. And it comes down to finding out who the veterans are at your university. How many women are there? How many men? How many LGBTQ plus individuals? How many trans individuals? What are the statistics? Like, where are the veterans at your university? And what do they want? How many of you guys do a survey at the beginning of your year? So, did anyone? Like a veteran survey, even if Just it's done survey. by the, the um, veteran office at your college. How many of y'all have to fill out or do a veteran survey? Yeah. But it will only go out to those that have already uh, signed in to engage as a member. So we're very limited. Okay. Makes sense. Well, here's an easier one. How's your what, How's your survey done? Uh, all of our surveys have to go through marker research and through uh, Ken Cow. So you're notified when we. My name's John. I'm the chapter president at Truckee Meadows Community College. Um, all of our surveys have to go through marketing and research. So. Um, you're identified as you enroll into Canvas, which is our web platform at the yeah. beginning of the year. Um, and then you self-identify different things and it brings you to different portals for the survey. So if you identify as a veteran, uh, which we have veterans that do not even identify as veterans, yeah. but we from the VRC know that there are more people using uh, 31 and 33 in voc rehab. Um, but it brings you to different questions and you submit um, the data that you want 
Are you marketing and research? Are you able to look at it? Um, there is a way to. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'll just ask that because, like, at UAA, we put we have the survey we send out usually. Well, so I, sorry to interrupt, but I guess here's a better question: How many of y'all talk to people at your university? How many of y'all talk to other veterans at your university? When you're talking to people, does veteran status come up at times when you're talking about what you're doing or if there's events going on, do you advertise your events by word of mouth? So the first step in, bringing in, in creating a gender inclusive campus is talking to people. If you're trying to find the veterans and you're trying to advertise to veterans, the best way to do that is to talk to them in person. Exhibit A is this entire conference. Because how many of y'all learned about NatCon because of the emails? How many of y'all learned about NatCon because, versus how many of y'all learned about NatCon because someone told you about it? Kind of deal. It's bringing, bringing in inclusivity and trying to break down these barriers of like the tradition, what people think of when they hear the word veteran. The first step is just talking to veterans and talking to people, seeing what they want. And it's simple as when you're having a conversation with a veteran, be like, hey, are you interested in joining an SVA? If yes, be like, cool, what kind of events would you like to see? What yeah. would entice you to join this SVA? Why would you want to join? And it's kind of one of those things of even non-veterans be like, hey, if you heard about this place where you could support veterans, what would you want to see there? So for us, I'm a, my college is a little different. So we're a four-year university, we're a public school. Everyone commutes. You, we don't have really housing. They come in and they leave. We don't have a student life. So we do a survey at the beginning of the year just saying, hey, what do you guys want to see this year? What's your interest is? What, and we send this to everyone that uses any military benefit. Thankfully, I have a base next to me, so we have a lot more access. UAA's about 40% of the population is a either active duty, military, spouse, dependent, family military member. Military connected in some Military way. connected in some way. How do I only have six members, right? And the one biggest thing is we found that people just didn't care for the main events we had. Um, what, what are some things that you guys do in, for your guys' chapters to bring new members or even different members of different minorities? other groups so we have um, really branched out we spoke to the Afghan um, the Afghan group and provided support to them especially after everything that was happening in August and talked to the other um, the black group and like you said but I think as important as the question is hey are you military connected and would you like to, to join if they say no then it's the why and what we get a lot is, I, I'm Jennifer Thurston at American University. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself. But they're, they're really disgruntled with the university and the lack of support. So they'd rather not even put themselves out there because then they just feel like they're going to be disappointed. That's, ooh, I don't want to have to. That's actually, for UA, that's a big thing. Who, who the most of your university, oh, sorry, go for it. When we did our membership drive, um, we immediately at the beginning of the semester grew our membership bigger than it ever had. And my simple question was to everybody in the four year as they were passing me is, do you want to support veterans on campus and in the community? And that was it. Yeah. And I got absolutely no one to say no. Wow. You had one too, right? It's just talking to people. Do you Go have for it. Okay, so we're from Northeast Lakeview College in San Antonio. We are a community college, and we are not veterans, but we are, our parents are, and we love veterans. We talk to them constantly every day. And she's the president, I'm the vice president. And some things that we do, because it's hard to get, it's hard for, okay, so community college, it's younger people. Um, it's hard, you know, you guys are older. It's hard to get more older people to come and veterans to come talk to young people it's young people running we're not even veterans like it's hard for them to even get engaged with us so if you guys have any tips one that would be great and two 
Um, we do did we did a virtual 5K. That was a good turnout, kind of, sort of. And then we also, for Veterans Week, we had a whole week for them. We gave out free tacos, not just to veterans, but veteran-affiliated. And then we also had a Zoom to for them to tell their stories and have a panel for they, so they can talk. So if y'all can give us any ideas how to get more. I, I just want to say thank you guys for being here. Um, one of my biggest goals is to get the word veteran out of our, our, our group. Military connections is something that I think is very important. I don't believe a chapter can just survive on veterans. At the end of the day, the GI Bill is being used so much more by spouses, um, family members, and honestly, veteran allies. They're, they make up as much important to us as anyone, especially because you can get them, they want to help. So why not accept them into the ranks to help? Turning it around, so as an older um, veteran myself, when you can turn it around and say, hey, we'd really like to be mentored, I'm not used to young people wanting to hear what I have to say. <laughs> so, so if you can flip that, and so instead of making it about us, because we don't necessarily ask for help or, or want young people to um, pay attention to us, so to speak, but if it's turned around that we're actually helping you, I, I, you'll get a lot of interest, but now how you market that is up to like your school and you. So I know you have a question, but unfortunately the interest of time, because we've only got a couple minutes left. Um, but bringing it back to that inclusivity piece, because that's why you're here, is to learn how to make the chapters more gender inclusive. It does come down to just finding out what your people like. I think we have about eight minutes or so I'll left. Or, more. Do we have more? Yeah, we have Am I done? Two, two oh, I done. apologize. I had a brain fart. Never mind then. Um, if you would still Happens. like to ask, ask your question or give the suggestion, by all means, go ahead. I don't know why I thought it ended at two. Um, pardon me. Um, so uh, we're also a community college. And, um, you know, I agree with your position on broadening the veteran. We have non-affiliated members they're not military dependents, they're not using benefits, they're members and they want to support veterans. At the same time, this is a veteran organization and it's veteran centered and it's to promote veterans and veterans issues. So where we find our veterans at the community college level is in our trade programs. And they're older, they're going at night, and they have families. So what we try to do is provide at every event something for children. Yeah. That's that's a big piece is you gotta, you gotta look at your age, right? You gotta look at what's an average veteran right now, age-wise, you would know. Um, it varies a lot by university, but um, 25, to 25 to 35, like it comes in the average age is 32. Yeah. And it varies a lot by university, and those are kind of, um, it's, it's, yeah. But um, it's really important, like I said, to find out where where the veterans are, what they want, and how to bring them in. Because like we were saying before, inclusivity doesn't just mean bringing more women into the chapter. It doesn't mean bringing more uh, trans people into the chapter. It means bringing more people into the chapter to get that diversity of opinion, to get that diversity of experience. So it's finding out where your chapter, where the veterans and military connected students at your university are. And the and I cannot harp on this enough, the easiest way to do that is just to talk to people. It's, so let's say, so we bring this piece, it's not just about bringing them in either, right? It's keeping them. How Making do you keep feel members, welcome. right? You gotta, for us, one of the biggest things I do every meeting, or I did at every meeting, I'm gonna get started again, is set ground rules. When you, who, who's done a leadership institute before? Highly suggest it. If you can do it, please take it. I actually came out as trans at our leadership in 2019 and then came out to my chapter right after that. So I highly recommend it. One of the greatest things that my cohort leaders did is they set ground rules. Every meeting set those ground rules. Be like, hey, we're gonna have a great meeting, um, but I wanna remember our bylaws because in our bylaws, we state what, a me what we're, we want to see in a meeting. And we always want to treat everyone how they want to be treated. 
the platinum rule, right? That's what, I don't remember what speaker said, but we use the platinum rule. And that we respect gender identities, gender diversities, uh, color, race, all of that. And the first time you might slip up, hey, I might give you a gentle reminder, but after that, if you keep doing that, at the end of the day, I will stop a meeting to protect those, the rest of the members. Setting those ground rules, that way someone doesn't come in, because there is a bit of a phenomenon I've noticed of people coming into meetings. They'll come for that first meeting, they'll see how that meeting goes, and based off of that meeting, they'll decide if they come back or not. So if those ground rules aren't set and someone comes in and they hear people joking about something that's very personal to them or making comments, disparaging comments about something that's very personal to them, they're not going to come back. So you've gotten them in the door, but now they'll never come back and they're probably not even going to speak very positively of the program. I went, I went to VFW um, to ask for money for 2020 NatCon to go to L.A. And when we walked in, they were making fun of transgender people. Did I ever want to go back there? No. Did we still pitch because I had my vice president treasurer with me? Yeah, I let them pitch. I stood in the back. I introduced myself as my dead name, and then I stopped talking. Have I ever been back to that VFW? No. Have I been to any VFW since? No. I personally don't feel safe there. The, these clubs, we got to remember, LGBT, especially trans, I'm going to throw the transgender card out there. We are very, we run. Um, I was, it was UT, I was telling me, you guys had a transgender member. Yes, and so um, one of the big reasons that Clemson has made a pretty big change is a lot of the times, and it's not just exclusive to transgender, a lot of the times when bringing people into your chapter, you get one chance. People don't. A lot of the times people, especially veterans, we've already been through a lot, we don't want to waste time. We don't want to come into some place that we don't feel welcome. We just want to, we, if we are going to a space, we want to go in, we want to see if we fit, and then if we do, we stay, if we don't, we get out. And it's very straightforward, so you get one chance. Um, one of the, like I said, one of the big reasons that uh, we have been focusing so much on this inclusivity piece is we have had people come in and give us that one chance and then leave. And it's actually, uh, and this happened a long time ago, but it actually caused our SVA numbers to drop drastically because they would come in, they would see this very active veteran in our community, they would tell people, hey, don't go to these meetings. Hey, this isn't a good place to be. Hey, this isn't a fun place to go. So it's, we get one chance, so it's really important, like setting those rules and setting those uh, bylaws and being like, this is how we're gonna operate, helps to prevent that. And it can also, if someone, because we're not trying to force anybody to stay, if someone doesn't want to come in, then they have get that snapshot right at the beginning of these are our rules, these are how we operate. If this isn't something that you're interested in, so be it kind of deal. But setting those ground rules at the very beginning can help kind of build that inclusive chapter and help people kind of realize that you're serious about bringing more people in. And that's something that I don't think a lot of chapters really think about is just like starting the meeting with the bylaws. Who, um, who has ever taken a class or decided not to take a class because of a bad word of mouth of a teacher? who's ever gone into a class on the first day, teacher said something rude, something, maybe said something about older students, maybe said something about veterans, and you're all like, I'm gonna transfer out. I'm not taking this class. Right. Exactly. It, that also applies to SVA chapters, and a lot of the times, the thing that I can guarantee y'all is that professor that you transferred out from, or that class that you never came back to, they don't know why you didn't come back. In their minds, they did nothing wrong, because they weren't told and y'all didn't tell them, and that's fine. Y'all don't have to tell them. But that's also something to keep in mind is that those veterans who have come in, they don't feel welcome and they leave, they're not gonna tell you why they didn't feel welcome. So it's very important to keep that proactive mindset rather than being reactionary as a chapter. Because it's very rare that someone will come up and be like, hey, this was a bad experience because of X, Y, Z. It's very rare, sometimes it happens. And if you're waiting for someone to say, hey, this is a problem, you're already too late. I also trying to get out bad word of mouth travels faster than good word of mouth. 
if you might have like, I know who, <laughs> I've used it, like ratemyprofessor.com. You never rate a good professor. You only rate the bad ones, right? It's like Google reviews. You only rate the places you have a bad experience at. So when you're doing that, when you're going to bring, try and bring people in, remember that. Keep those. And don't, when you are talking to members, so like that third strike, I've had to, I've had to have a conversation with a member that's been active senior year. He's been five years at the university, super active with the club, brought money in all time. After the meeting was over, I, t I asked him to stay late. I had my vice president stay with me. You always have a witness. Never do it alone, but don't do it in front of everyone. And I'm like, hey, you gotta knock it off, man. This was someone who was repetitively, repetitively breaking the bylaws, bylaws, breaking the rules, and making people feel uncomfortable. You gotta show that you're not just gonna let them slide, but you don't do it in front of the whole group. That just, it just, you do it in front of the whole group. It's kind of like a mass punishment, you know. You never liked those in basic training. You do it on one on one because it's more personal. And you, they might be like, they might not even realize. And they're like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Or they might have had something go on like they lost their kid and that they're taking out the sadness or anger on the group and they, they're sorry about it. So, with the last few minutes, 18 to be exact, how do you guys run your guys? How do you guys get, break those boundaries? How do you bring people that aren't the typical white, or how do you bring people in yeah, into who your don't club? fit the traditional definition of what everyone imagine, imagines when they say veteran? How do y'all invite people that don't, not necessarily don't look like you, but people who have differing experiences than you into your chapter? What do you guys do? So this is an example of when I was an undergrad at Western Oregon University and I was the chapter president. Um, this was during the COVID year, so I was very stressed to just fill slots. And just my demographic, people who look, look and think like me kind of were the first to fill the positions. But what I did to bring in other people and have others in the military connected community at Western feel involved was I spoke with the advisor and asked like, are there any like dependents that come in or women, vet women veterans or black LGBTQ? And I, and I kind of reached out to them personally. And it, it was a little weird just trying to email because it's so much better to do it in person. But I said, just come to one of our events. You know, I'm gonna, I did set ground rules. It was more or less just, you know, we're gonna introduce everyone and kinda not bring up old business and no business at all during like Zoom or like activ online activity events like trivia. And as I start, as restrictions kinda eased, I was able to kind of say, hey, we're doing this like beach cleanup on the Oregon coast. You know, it's, it's an underground event, like the school probably wouldn't sanction it, but a couple chapters in Virginia do these type of events, so why not us? And there was a lot of autonomy that people were able to feel, and like I also tried, one technique that I used was kind of avoiding like military verbiage to kind of also help with the, the transition process. And like I said, it's gotten some results, not what the inclusivity that I kind of envisioned, but I think that also has to just go back to COVID and just the demographics at the school, like being a little factor to what I've probably perceived as underperforming. But it does start with leadership kind of kiboshing the bad behavior. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's not, you can't build a bridge in a day, right? It's going to take time. It's take that word of mouth. It's going to take, I've seen chapters grow in a year. I've seen chapters that take five years. I mean, it's, it's a slow process. I think who, anyone else have any? We ever heard from some of these people over there. I see some. Go for it. Ask it. And if you guys have questions now too, please ask them. We can try to answer them as best, or anyone in here can answer. 
So my name's Liz, I'm from Auburn University. Um, we are a very, very large university and very diverse. However, I know as a female veteran, there are times when I don't want to identify as a veteran. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people who use veteran benefits who don't necessarily want anything to do with being vet, like being veteran. How do you get them to buy in, basically? That it's okay to be both. You don't have to be one or the other, if that makes sense. That's, that's the age old question, right? That's the question I think every Blake out session I've been in has tried to answer this week. My biggest way is I ask them, I ask them to go have coffee. I try to find out why. I'm like, I also tell them, like, you don't even have to dis display that you're a veteran. I try to give them some options just to be involved still. I'm like, if you don't want to say, oh, I was a Marine, blah, 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 blah. All right, why, why don't you just come as Joe Snow? Come and hang out with us at bowling that we're going to pay for. You and your kids and your wife, free bowling. Or, hey, we're going to go watch uh, Private Ryan was one that we actually did a big movie drive for Halloween or something like that. I don't know why. And we're like, hey, we were trying to get anyone. We're like, come on down. We got two theaters full of empty seats. Just come watch some TV with us. You can meet them and try to just remind them that you don't have to represent being a veteran. I know this is an organization of veteran. They might be using the VA benefits and stuff, but you don't have to say you're a veteran at these meetings. You can say you're Joe, you're just a, someone that supports veterans, and then they sooner or later they might get comfortable enough to come out as a veteran, or they might just tell you stuff in secret. I've had one member that was like that, and I got a lot more. Hey, this is my after meeting stuff. He'll come like, hey, I'm having problems with my VI bill. My GI Bill, can you help me? Or hey, I saw this thing about uh, Washington Week for SVA. What is that? Or some uh, some stuff they would come on the side, that DL, but as they wouldn't know that until you brought them into it. And it's uh, one of the things that I've noticed that tends to help people feel more welcome is moving away from the hey, what's your name? Your what's your name and your branch? Uh, moving away from like the military themed names, the military like meeting names. Like uh, Clemson used to have a newsletter called the Sit Rep. Nobody read it. We changed the name to um, the. I think we we changed the name. I can't think of the name off the top of my head. It was like I think it was like Paws and Stripes is what we called it. Not as military related. We immediately started people getting more buy in. P things from like dependents, people who didn't want to associate so strongly with that military identity. Because there's no real right or wrong way to be a veteran. And the minute you start saying that, hey, you have to identify your branch, hey, you have to tell us about your military service, people who don't want to connect probably will disconnect. So keeping away from that military terminology and changing the way you approach these groups can help a lot when it comes to um, attracting people who don't want to be in their veteran status. Um, I actually have a question um, because, you know, I, I do have some data and the core of our um, enrolled veterans are in the trade programs, they're older, um, so majority of the trade programs, uh, they're, they're men, uh, they're white men, they're of a certain demographic and age. Now, to date, our enrollments are off by 18% for veterans for the next semester. These are veterans dropping out of school because they don't want the vaccine, they don't want the mask mandate, and they don't like the culture of inclusivity at the school as it is. And we're losing the mode, which is the mass amount of our veterans, you know? We did a call campaign and talked to each one of them. Well, that's the thing is, you know, I, I tried talking to them about like, um, and, it, and it didn't work out well. I said, you know, look, there's a safe space to come in here and be offensive, but we're going to talk about it, all right? And, um, you know, I mean, I, I made some headway with some people, but, um, you know, largely, um, it's like everybody's in these like echo chambers, right? And yes. they don't want to break out of that echo chamber. 
welcome to, to, I think all the universities are feeling that. You, in large part, too, at least from my experience in the DMV, um, I don't know if most of your schools have an inclusive excellence campaign or initiative right now. Exactly. That was exactly what I was going to say. Yep. So they tout this uh, agenda, which they're getting millions of dollars uh, funded, and but we're left out of that conversation. And, and so it's not really inclusivity. So that's where you, as your, I don't know about you guys, for you guys as president, we work straight with our deans and the chancellor. I actually have met. At the time, our chancellor, we just got a brand new one. I better go meet him. I worked hand-in-hand -hand with them. Um, our five-year plan and stuff, it includes veteran stuff. It includes our, what they want to see our club as. It includes every club, actually. That's how our old event, our chancellor was. They, they made it so that that was one of their big marketing points. But for your question, it's time of the days, right? Uh, <laughs> You, that's where you can. That's when it comes to meeting veterans where they are. It, it's finding out who the veterans at the university are, who they want to be involved with, and then bringing them in because I feel a lot of people, and I know that this can be true, there's a lot of statistics that show this. A lot of people uh, don't necessarily know why things are happening the way they are. Yeah. They don't know, they're making these comments or these jokes. And they don't know why it's as much of a problem as it is. For to answer two, sometimes you just have to have those two meetings. Have one meeting that does the half that are want to be more inclusive, and then sometimes you have to have those old meetings back at the VFW. It, it, from my own personal yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's hard. It, yeah, ours. And there's, unfortunately, one of the biggest things that we run into is a lot of the times we can't control the actions of our schools. A lot of the times we can't make them do something. We can't make them include veterans. What we need to do is it comes down to finding those people who are leaving, asking why, and bringing data to the school. So answer your point, UAA, we, we close campus. We're a very liberal school in a southern, the, nor the southernest northern state you've ever met. It's Alaska. Most northern southern state. Yeah, whatever, however you want to phrase it. <laughs> so what we did is we chose meetings in other places that they, people could choose what they wanted to wear. If they wanted to wear the mask or not wear the mask. That, that they want to be vaccinated or not vaccinated. One of those things, I, as I, I, never, I don't mandate it. I know the schools do, and I say, hey, that is the school policy. I have, I'll put your voice in, I go to the club student governments, I go sit with the dean, I will fight for your voice, but you gotta understand at the end of the day, I can only do so much until they see you, you coming with me. I invite them to those meetings. I mean, it, that's how we get sometimes their foot. You have to storm their office and sit there. I mean, that's how we got some of the budget cuts for education. Alaska, two years ago, we were going to lose $2.4 billion off our university the next year. So a bunch of those students went to the governor's office and sat there until he talked to us. We forced the hand. You do it peacefully, obviously. I'm not saying go violent, but you, and you let them know. We gave them plenty of notice. But sometimes you just have to invite your, your chapter go to give them worries or have, invite them to your chapter meetings. You have, um, to, you have to meet them where they are, ask what they want to do, ask them why, get that information, then use that to metaphorically, of course, kick down the door kind of deal. Uh, there's a lot of, um, there is a lot of up, upheaval and, uh, and unrest right now. And that's kind of just the nature of the beast I've noticed. It, it doesn't help that being a veteran, we're, we're politicized, right? Yeah. Everything you do as a veteran is look to the media. Left media says one thing, right media says something else. It sucks. Um, SVA has done such a great job. And this is why I love this organization, staying in that middle ground, fighting for us, not letting the left and right 
when pull them to one side. It's a hard place. I, I feel for you. I also had the same problem. I have the older generation that don't want to be do the art stuff or they want to just go sit at the bar and drink. But then I also have active duty members that are 18 that can't even go do that. So it's where sometimes you just have to be like, I, I, my vice president, yeah, I, we, I was like, I, so this is what, this is our event night. I did a meeting one time where I was like, my vice president's going to take our older guys. They're going to go to the bar. It was a bowling alley. The bowling's pretty, you bowl or bingo in Alaska. Not much else there. I, and I, as a sober person, I don't drink that much, or I drink here. This is like one of the rare events I drink at. Um, I took the, everyone else underage and went bowling. Well, you guys were in the same space. You started off the meeting together, but then you went into your separate spaces. It's also worth noting that when you do these events to try to bring more people in, it's not a bad thing if your entire chapter doesn't show up. Yeah. If you're doing an event and you're wanting to bring more young people in and you do an event that's geared towards young people and your older members don't show up, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because at the end of the day, you're trying to make the SVA a place for everybody to be. And the first step is getting people in the door because once you've gotten people in the door and you've gotten that dif those differences of voices, then you can start trying to be like, hey, we want to get the entire chapter together for an event. What are some suggestions? I, I've even, this is a secret, but I've told some members not to go to an event. I had a few members that were cranky about some of the some of the rules and policies that were happening at the school. I'm like, hey, why don't you skip this event? It was when we we're trying to do a big drive, bring a new thing, but I also had like, the chancellor was gonna be there, some school administrators. I said, this is what's gonna happen. If you're gonna do that, I have to have you on your best behavior. Cause it was funding too. We were looking at trying to get some funding. So I gave him the option. I'm like, hey, maybe this is a better event you skip out on and then come back next week or next month for our next meeting. And that's going to be mean a lot more to those types of individuals because, like I said, we're trying to get more people, more voices into the chapter to build a bit better chapter, not to build a better event. So allowing people, like giving people that grace and being like, hey, we're doing this event. If you don't feel like this fits what you want to do, then don't go. But the next time we have a meeting, be like, hey, these are my ideas. Tell people that it's, it's all right to not go to every single event so long as they come up with ideas for more events kind of deal. Um, meet people where they are and give people that opportunity because the first step, like even if you're doing one event for younger people, one event for older people, the more they come, the more welcome they feel in that sector, the more you can kind of start to blend them together. It, it can be a pull things together kind of deal to create that more inclusive chapter kind of deal. I just wanted to mention also, too, that um, if you look at your school's five-year plan, um, which was the, um, the inclusive excellence, and they define it, at least at American, I think it's pretty universal as diverse, inclusive, and equitable policies and procedures for every individual. And if you can actually take their words even if they don't respond and shoot them back to them and ask them the why and they ignore you, then seek out you know, the different um, positions, whether you do a sit-in, whether we're doing a petition, and if you can partner with those organizations that the school is focusing on. The you know, hot topic right now is our black and brown community, which is really important that we support, and our LGBTQ communities. Um, and fortunately for us, our LGBTQ community, their advisor is also the advise, advisor of the student journalism. So that was a great buy-in for us as well. And so slowly we're starting to get some changes incorporated, but it hasn't been the easy way. We've really had to take their words and show them where they're actually not being inclusive. At the, at the end of the day, I know it kind of sucks being present. You have a lot of responsibilities. When I, I literally got on every board I could. I would go to the concert board, the club council board. I got asked to be president of the club council. I got, went to student government meetings. I went to chancellor meetings. I went to everything I could 
so that they knew that we were going to be there and we held them to the responsibilities that they had. If they, we, I'm lucky and our old chancellor is very friendly to our clubs and our mil especially the military because we have a base right next to us. We have Elmendorf and Fort Rich and we actually have a campus on base. So we were very lucky that they're very open about that. But I, now we're not. They have shut us out and I'm working our way back in. So I feel you there. It's, you just have to, sometimes you have to fake it till you make it, you know? You, you know your members and if, it's, if your older members are feeling left out, sometimes you have to be like, hey, how can I help you then to feel more into it? And if it's just a mask, I, okay, is there a place that you guys recommend that would allow masks and not masks to meet? Simplest thing is asking someone, hey, why don't you plan the next meeting? If, why don't you give me, here's some guidelines I got, has to have, they have to have, be, have the option to wear masks and good food, I don't know, something like that. And you plan it and bring it back to me in a week and I'll say okay or nay. Power suggestion. You let them, let them do the work, you know. Yeah, let me, and let me know how it goes. Please, and any of you guys can reach out. If you guys go into the app, check in here, please reach out to me. I, I can help as much as I can, right? Uh, Austin here is a staffer, and she would love to help you too. And I'm sure many of you guys have other ideas. Every, you guys, I hate to say this, Alaska is way different than Georgia or community <laughs> colleges or other bigger universities. We're kind of different. But we act as a community college. <laughs> it does act as a community college quite a bit. Um, but if I can say anything, being from a university in the South, okay. is that it's very, You're very welcome. important. There's two main things that if you get anything from this today, there's two main things that I'd like you to take away from it. And Becky may have different, but in my perspective, these are the two most important things. Is one, inclusivity means everybody. It just means different voices. It means having everybody represented. It means having as many different experiences and as many different voices in your chapter as you can. And that inclusivity takes a lot of time. You're not going to implement these changes or start doing these more open meetings and boom, have a more inclusive chapter. It's going to be, you get one or two people come in who may not have come in before. They have a good experience, they go talk to people. Then you get two or three more people, two or three, and it does take a long time. And that's not necessarily something that I know chapter presidents or chapter members really want to hear because everyone wants to kind of get these things done quickly and help expand and leave the chapter better than they found it. But at the end of the day, the best thing that you can do as a chapter leader or even just a chapter member is help set the foundation in place for inclusivity because it does take a lot of time. And like I said, I know, to, I know that y'all don't like to hear that because it's always, what can we do to make this better? Um, it's like, that is our mission. We are going to go take care of it. But it does, at some point, you do have to make the decision of, I can just set this into motion. How do I set it into motion in a way that's going to better the lives for everybody around me? Oh, is it on now? Yeah. I keep turning it off and on. It takes a minute. My final thing, because it's time to go. I won't hold you so much longer is if you don't see a voice around you or in your meetings, go search it out. It, sometimes they might want you to reach out to them because they didn't know about you. I mean, at the end of the day, I spent my first four years at UAA. I didn't even know about our SVA club. It was active. It had barbecues and all this other fun stuff. No idea that I was around. I was over in a different part of campus. It wasn't being reached there. So then once someone, the president actually, or an email came out and my friend saw it on the thing and that's how I became president. She's like, I'm gonna sign you up to become, to be, to be voted as president because it was the election ballots and I won. And then I fell in love. So go out to those, reach out to the other um, apartments that you might not have. Go to the art dean. I don't know how you guys are set up or the president of that special ballot and say, hey, I know you guys have some veterans. Can I put some posters or come speak to your classes? Finally, 
just keep working. At the end of the day, you're going to build the road, so it's one brick at a time. Know that you might not get that far, but train your people that are going to become a president, president or vice president next. Build that road map so they can start following it and keep building. That's all you can do. Build that foundation so that as your SVA grows and as time moves forward, you can build a more inclusive SVA chapter. That's so, actually time to go. I'm not just being done this time. So I hope you guys have a good day. Hope you have a rest of the ball tonight. I'm going to be drinking, so if you see me, please come high five me. I'm going to be drinking root beer. So. And thank you, all for the, thank you all for the conversation. I really appreciate it. I know it was a little bit more scattered than some of the other breakout sessions that we've had, but I really appreciate the open conversation yeah. and y'all listening and stuff.